All right, excellent. Hello, welcome. Um, so I'm very happy to um, share this video with everybody. I'm starting a new little YouTube lecture series here. This, this is going to be the first part in that series. Uh, and it's going to focus on the, the super basics, uh, fundamental kind of background information that you need to know, or uh, I would argue that you need to know to be a successful audio engineer. So without further ado, uh, this is going to be a multi-part series. This first lecture here is about the basics of electricity. Um, it's going to be hopefully the shortest one. Then we're going to move on to conductors, insulators, and semiconductors, volts, current, resistance, and power. The next one is going to be Ohm's law. And then we're going to talk about DC and AC electricity. Next, we're going to talk about the water analogy. And then finally, the metric system. So um, yeah. Let's move on. So we're going to talk about the basics of electricity for this short video. And this is something that, that can be difficult to talk about um, without over confusing things or sort of, um, you know, it's like that there, there's a correct way of talking about electricity in terms of how a physicist will think about electricity or electrical engineer will think about electricity. And actually both of those are different and they use kind of different analogies and some different ways to sort of calculate things. So we don't really want to fall into that trap because it's really not important that we understand the physics of the universe in order to like mix a song, right? Or like be, or make a synthesizer, or be a good audio engineer. So um, we're going to take, you know, this is going to be a kind of really dumbed down high level view of it at first. And then later on in later videos and later lectures, we're going to kind of pick apart and maybe disassemble a little bit of the analogies that we use here. We're going to expand upon them a little bit. Um, and we're going to adjust them as needed in order for us to get the appropriate um, analog for the type of work that we're doing. And that's super important, right? So, um, Abstraction is super important. That's what a map is. A map is an abstraction of a real place, right? And you want to make sure that the size of your map or sort of like that corresponds with the purpose of the map. Okay, now, and I guess what I'm trying to say is like, if I'm making a transportation map, right? And if I'm trying to make a map that's showing you how to drive from San Francisco to New York City, you want to have that map so that the scale is pretty um, small, as in you can fit that map on, on one page or maybe two pages, and so that you can, and you want to be able to show the major kind of um, intersections between the roads that that person is going to have to go down, the turns they're going to have to make, and blah, 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 right? Now, by doing that, you're losing a lot of information, right? Like you are losing the information um, of a lot of like where small little towns are, or where like tiny little side roads are. That stuff isn't important, so you leave it out of this map because you care about going from San Francisco to Los Angeles, right? Now, if instead, now, if that map was created on a one-to-one -one scale, meaning that like one inch on the map is equal to one inch on real world in the real world, you're going to be left with a map that is the size of the continental United States. Is You can fit all the information in the continental United States on that map because it's just the continental United States. I don't know if that makes sense, but the idea is that that map, that big, the one-to-one -one scale map that is the size of the continental United States, it is far more accurate than this tiny little scaled down piece of paper you have, but it's also far less useful for the purpose of driving from San Francisco to New York City. Now, you can go the other way. You know, a lot of times physicists uh, biologists, a bunch of different professions, a lot of scientific professions and engineers, um, electronic engineers, mechanical engineers, they'll make maps where the map is bigger than the actual thing, right? So when you're designing an iPhone for, for Apple, you're, you're, not, you're using schematics and these diagrams of these tiny little components and parts that are inside of this iPhone, right? And you're making your map way bigger than the actual real world because that's what you need to do in order to get the most useful use out of that that reflection that analogy of the real world anyways that's a long tangent get used to them that's kind of my style talking about stuff so anyway so when it comes to audio um engineering and just kind of audio in general it's good to know a little bit of basic uh sort of high level physics in terms of how does electricity work what is electricity right so what are these mechanisms that are happening and that is causing us to have this phenomenon that we call electricity which we're then able to leverage and harvest for our own uh, means right so ultimately 
ultimately, a lot of this has to come down to the way that, that atoms are made up. So atoms are these tiny little building blocks that every single thing in the universe is, uh, that's inaccurate, that most things are made out of, right? So most things are made out of, out of, out of trillions and trillions upon trillions of atoms. Anything from my hair to like this microphone over here to that wall back there, they're made up of a whole bunch of different types of atoms that are slammed together. Now, atoms themselves, which are these, these really, really super, super tiny building blocks, there's no way you can, you can see them with the naked eye. They're made up of, of three fundamental building blocks, or three fundamental pieces, right? Um, fundamental, again, is sort of a misleading term because there are smaller, more fundamental pieces than some of these, but we'll just call them fundamental for now, right? That's as, this is as deep as we need to go. We don't need to start talking about quantum mechanics and quarks and all that super scary stuff. But it is important to know that atoms are made up of protons, always protons, usually, almost all the time, some number of neutrons, and all the time, some number of electrons. Now, the protons and neutrons are in the center of the atom in what's called the nucleus. And this is sort of this ball, this compressed ball of mass that is in the center of the atom. And then you can think of the electrons as these, these kind of little dots that are orbiting around this ball, sort of like the moon orbits around the Earth. Now this is using, again, slightly inaccurate if we're talking about how things really work, but for the purpose of our discussion, we're gonna use this model. This is called the Newtonian model for thinking about um, atoms and that sort of stuff, right? So, um, what, and, and this stuff is kind of interesting. It's not super you know, important to know, but the number of protons that are in this nucleus determines what type of atom it is. So if you have one proton, then you're looking at hydrogen. And then um, if you have, uh, you know, 67 or something like that, you're looking at gold. I don't, I don't remember what the exact number is, but the number of protons determines what type of, of atom you have. The number of neutrons varies. So you can have a hydrogen atom that has no neutrons. So it just has one proton and an electron orbiting it, or you can have one that has a neutron attached to it. And that's kind of um, a heavy, a, a isotope is what we call it. So it's a variation of this fundamental um, hydrogen atom. And it does react in different ways. It has different mass and it, it does different things, right? If you've ever heard the term like heavy water before, that's, um, that is attributed towards the atomic structure that normally is water with these extra kind of neutrons added on. So it has these different properties and it does different things. Now, um, for our for the purpose of our discussion, there's a, there's kind of two things that are important. So those other things are just kind of interesting tidbits I like to put in there. Now, what is important to know is that the protons give a positive charge and the electrons give a negative charge. Okay, and the neutrons give no charge at all. So neutrons have no influence on the charge of things, and that's why there can be kind of like variable numbers of them. Uh, you can think of it that way, right? Um, the other thing that is kind of important to know is that depending on the number of electrons you have orbiting your nucleus, you um, may have multiple kind of like rings of electrons, so multiple layers. So there's only like a certain number of electrons that can fit really close to this this um, neutron. And you can think of it at, I mean, the nucleus. And you can think of it as there's only so much space you know, for them to, to orbit around. And if there's, and it's just impossible for there to be more than two. And then there's impossible for there to be more than, I forget if it's four or six on the next shell, right? So you have these, so they're called kind of shells or, or layers, right? So you have different layers. And the, the topmost one is, is referred to as the valence shell. So this is the outermost shell, it is the highest layer. So if you have two layers, the valence shell is the second layer. If you have one layer, the valence shell is the first layer. If you have 57 layers, impossible, but pretend like you do, then the valence shell is the 57th layer. Cool? Um, so yeah, so this is, and why this is important is because, um, spoiler alert, electricity is the movement of electrons between atoms. So it's when atoms, um, have specific characteristics, have their specific forces applied to them that causes these electrons to move from one atom to another. Now, 
this can only occur if the valence shell has specific properties that allow it to occur. And there are only certain elements which have valence shells that have those properties which allow the electrons to move from one to another, okay? So you can, so this is sort of, uh, yeah, same sort of diagram, right? So you can, you can imagine that there's this nucleus, there's this ball in the middle, it's protons and neutrons, and around it, orbiting it, you have these electrons. And you can see that um, this is an example of like, a um, um, an element that has two electron shells and the valence shell would be the second one the one that's on the outside that's containing the four electrons and sort of like I said earlier once the way the the basic the most basic way to think about electric electricity or I don't know if it's the most basic way but a basic way that's useful for music technologists is you think of it as the atoms are are, are immobile. So you have um, a length of wire that the actual atoms of, of steel or copper that are in that, that wire are not moving back and forth. They're, they're still, they're, they're, they don't move, they're immobile, but there's electrons that are jumping from one to another. And you can see that there's this positive symbol right here, a negative symbol right here, and it has the word battery and battery. And that means this is what happens when you apply what's called a voltage um, to a conductive material. So if you have a material, so copper is an element that is conductive, and what makes it conductive is that its valence shell has openings or an excess or excess, so more than it needs of these electrons, and it's able to very easily share these electrons uh, between atoms. And when a voltage is applied, you can think of it as a pressure, sort of pushing these electrons from one side of the material to the other side. So electrical systems are reliant on the movement of loose electrons from one atom to the next, and that's, that's essential to understand. They're reliant on the movement of loose electrons from one atom to the next. So in order for you to have a conductive material, you have to have a valence shell that has an opening, an easy opening for the electron to move from one to another. Because uh, without getting into physics too much, the creating new valence shells is a very energy intensive process and something that um, can't really be done. So if you have a, a um, I mean, it can be done with a huge amount of energy, but if you have an a atom and if it has two electrons, so it's filling up its lower layer, layer valence shell, it's nearly, basically any electrons can be moving past that, that atom is, is just going to, that the electrons is going to bounce off. It's going to reflect off. It's not going to create a new valence shell. Um, in order for that to happen, there has to be an overwhelming positive force. Um, so yeah, so anyways, electricity is the movement of electrons between atoms. Electrons create a charge. And this is when we're talking about kind of some terminology here. And this is something that will, will become more important in our later chats and later discussions. But the, the thing is that the term electrical charge is often misused as well as other terms are related to electronics such as power and energy and those sorts of things. Now, as a music technologist, you want to make sure that you know the distinction between these terms are often used in an interchangeable way. So electric charge is one of these terms that can be kind of confusing. So ele electric charge is not the same as electricity. Electricity is a movement of electrons between atoms. Okay. Now, electrons create a charge. They have a charge. They have a negative charge. Right? And then we can kind of manipulate and harness that negative charge in order to do work. Now, we harness it for energy. We use that as energy. Um, so the electric charge is really the movement of these electrons from one um, atom to another. So the charge is moving through the device. The charge is negative because we're talking about electrons. Now you can also have a positive charge um, and then those atoms are generally not moving so that's not going to be like a dynamic charge but the charge is positive. Basically you can think of charge as if you add up all of the protons and if you add up all the electrons in an atom and then you look at the number it gives you. If you assign negative one to every electron and plus one to every proton and if you're left, you're left with a number at the end. If it's zero, then that atom has no charge. If it's like two or three or one, 
If it's a positive number, it has a positive charge. If it's negative one, negative two, negative three, it has a negative charge. When we're talking about electricity, there are two different types, kind of general types of electricity, or, or two different uh, mechanisms in which electricity kind of reveals itself in, in the day-to-day -day occasions. The first one is uh, referred to as static electricity. This is something that we generally do not um, use as directly. Um, it is a rapid transference of electrons between objects. Now this is the best example of static electricity can, is lightning. Lightning is, is static electricity. Static electricity is coming from a, a hugely uh, disproportionate difference in voltage levels between the cloud layer and the ground. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of volts, millions of volts, and it causes this rapid, rapid transference of electricity, right? It happens for a fraction of a second. It's super intense, super destructive. We know lightning. Another example is, you know, if you scruff your feet on the ground with socks on and you go touch a metal doorknob, it'll give you a little shock, right? Or sometimes you'll touch a friend or, you know, your your um, your partner or something like that, and a little, little spark will happen. That's also static electricity. And that's actually, a, you know, very high difference in voltage between you two. You're transferring a little bit of electricity back and forth. Now, dynamic electricity is, is more what we usually tend to think about and use, especially in audio. Um, and that is the constant flow of electric of electrons. So dynamic electricity is sort of is the electricity you get coming out of your wall socket. It is electricity that's powering my laptop. It is electricity that all audio operates on. It's a constant flow of electrons. Now, those electrons can be changing directions, but they're constantly sort of moving. It's not a, a one shot um, burst. Right, that's the distinction. All right, so uh, one thing that will be really fun for us to do is I want everyone to pause this video and take a few minutes to just write down um, answers to these questions to the best of your knowledge and best of your ability. And this is a great thing to do, I think, whenever you're trying to learn anything new or uh, cover new topics to sort of test your knowledge of what you know on that thing beforehand and then revisit this knowledge later on in your learning experience and then you can update it and you can kind of see how your, your knowledge and understanding of this has evolved. And that's the thing about this video series and about my teaching style in general is I really want you to kind of understand um, why? Because that's how you remember. Um, if you just memorize kind of like facts and um, statistics, then those are very easy to forget if you don't have to use them on a constant basis, right? So we remember stupid statistics such as like there's 12 inches to a foot because we tend to have to use that pretty frequently. But it, there's no, like, it, it doesn't, the, the why is dumb, right? There isn't, and we don't really remember the why. Um, but another example is how many yards are in a mile, right? I, I don't think most people know that. It's like, you know, 5,600 and something, or 4,800 and something. It's like some crazy stupid number. But like, yeah, no average person really knows that because there's no need to randomly know that. However, I bet you were taught that at some point in grade school. You're taught there's 12 inches to a foot. You're taught how many feet are to a yard, three, and how many yards to a mile. Anyways, what is audio? What is electricity? What is sound? And also sort of, you know, what's the distinction between them? How is electricity used in audio? How is electricity used in sound? Is it used in those? How is sound used in... <laughs> our, 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 let me rephrase. Is audio and sound the same thing? Anyways, we'll revisit those in a later video and, and discuss those. Those will be each, a, I think, a topic of um, a later video. We've already discussed what is electricity a little bit. So anyways, um... One thing that's important to know is the law of electrostatic when it comes to um, music technology or law of electrostatics. Um, and that is a fancy way of formalizing the experiments that we've all done with magnets in grade school. Uh, where you have like the red side of the magnet is positive and then the white side is negative and then you get them to like connect to each other and repel each other, right? And going back to that time, uh, if you remember, like when you put the two positive sides of those magnets together, they push each other away. They're repelled because they both are the same charge. Um, but if you flip it around, if you have the negative to positive, they psh, clamp together. They, they pulled each other um, together, they wanted to touch. And that's the law of electrostatics, and that's basically saying that like or similar charges, and like being positive and positive, negative and negative, those are going to repel each other. They're going to push each other away. 
So a atom that has a really strong positive charge is not going to want to hang out next to another atom that has another really strong positive charge. They're, want to, they're going to want to sit a certain distance away from each other. Now, um, conversely, unlike or dissimilar charges are going to attract each other. All right. Um, I very, very highly recommend this video on electromagnetism if anybody um, is interested in, oops, uh, getting more information on that. So if I was lecturing, you know, in a university or something like that, we would probably watch this video and discuss it. Um, but I don't want to do that for copyright reasons. Instead, I want to uh, have you watch that on your own if you're interested. Cool. Another important important concept that we should get out of the way at the beginning here is what an electric field is. So electric field is a concept that was introduced by uh, a gentleman named Michael Faraday. And there are quite a few things that are named after him in electronics. He's an important figure. Um, and he discovered that an electrical field uh, is something that acts between two charges in a similar way to gravitational field acts between two masses. And what, what that's sort of saying, that, that's saying a, a few things. Um, two of the big takeaways is that this action is not linear. So if you have two magnets that are, that are pretty far away, um, or moderately far away, they're not going to act on each other at all because this magnetic field, that force of attraction that surrounds anything that's magnetic, dissipates quickly. It dissipates um, in the same way the gravity dissipates. So, and the other thing is that going back to what we know about gravity is we know that the gravity is a two-way street. So, an object, the big object does not act as this immovable mass that then smaller objects will rotate around. All, everything that has a mass is going to act on everything else that has a mass. Um, so, in, you can think of it, this is like a technically too true, but overwhelmingly <laughs> kind of like a simplified and not really true statement but you can think of it this way as in if you jumped up off of the earth you're actually and you fall back down to the earth the earth is attracting you primarily um you are being sucked to the earth but also the earth is being sucked to you slightly when you jump up so these two and if you have two suns are orbiting each other they both are affecting each other the orbit of the earth around the sun is actually affecting the position of the sun a teensy bit not nearly 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 as much as the sun is affecting the earth but they're affecting each other um slightly cool so these so the idea ultimately is that these charges, so these electrical charges, a positive charge or a negative charge, are going to act on each other across space, so across a certain distance. And the distance in which these two items will actually act on each other, will attract one to the other, is what we refer to as the electric field. So it's kind of like the activity radius, right? You know, so uh, you could, uh, like, to use a video game analogy, if you have, like, a turret that's, like, defending your base and it, can, it has a certain attack range, right? And you can attack everything within that range, but everything without that range, it can't attack. So it's, like, useless for anything outside of that range. It's sort of like that's the electric field. So so we would say that that attack radius is, like, the 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 size of the electric field for a certain object that's magnetic. As in, any, it won't have any influence on any object that's beyond that field. All right. Cool. So that concludes um, this chat about the basics of electricity. It's a very kind of technical discussion, I know. And it's a discussion that, you know, technically is not necessary for um, every music technologist, but is something that if you internalize some of these concepts, which we will through learning about how this applies to electricity and electronics and music technology, which is all based around electricity and electronics, then you have a better understanding of what is actually going on. Like, you know, um, this eventually leads to understanding how hardware synthesizers work and also software synthesizers and understanding how to um, manipulate um, voltage levels and manipulate gain levels inside of DAWs. What do decibels really mean? How do they actually relate to each other? So. Um, 
when you take a sound pressure le reading with a loudness meter, what do those different settings mean? Um, all that sort of stuff. So this is coming soon. There's a lot of applicable knowledge that comes out of this, uh, which we're going to discuss soon. Um, next thing that we're going to discuss is, is the relationship between conductors, insulators, and semiconductors. The so three different categorizations that we have for materials when we're discussing um, electricity and electronics. So I'm very much looking forward to that chat uh, in the next video. Excellent.